morning, everyone. Welcome to our first talk. We have Stefano, who will be discussing, as it says, tales from the APT world. Uh, Stefano is a malware researcher with RSA. And um, I'll let him take it away. Uh, okay. You hear me, right? Okay, thank you very much, guys. And uh, I have, as always, always I hope in the, any conference, I, I just apologize for my spaghetti English. But, <laughs> but about that, um, we will cover today um, one of the investigations I ran recently. Uh, it's related from um, uh, an attack to a uh, huge, and I say huge, uh, logistic organization uh, carried out by the uh, a new, or at least not yet uh, quite known, um, APT, APT group. And uh, this attack was showing interesting uh, news in terms of uh, strategies in tactics and tools. So it was definitely uh, an argument that I want to discuss with, with, uh, in a conference like this. Thank you very much. So <clears throat> uh, the first step of the uh, investigation started. Uh, we done anomaly recorded in Sao Paulo, in Brazil, from our standard users in a, in a logistic warehouse where it was loading uh, some lost and found items uh, of uh, expedition that were recovered by uh, people in, in the warehouse. So <clears throat> during the late shift, uh, this guy was in charge of loading this type of information. And um, it was basically accessing the website, as usual. Uh, the website is basically the front end of a uh, database that is shared through the whole, the, world, the whole organization. The organization is present in uh, about 100 uh, different countries, so it's really huge. Uh, but when he was attempting to load info into, into the website, it was having problem because every time he went into sending uh, something from the, uh, from the UI, it was coming with errors with strange errors about uh, SQL database. So he decided simply to send an email to his boss saying, this is a technical problem. Uh, I definitely can't finish this. So uh, I will probably shift this uh, activity to the next, to the next uh, uh, colleague. Uh, the following one was having the same problem. And at one point, the boss, uh, the, the, the following day, will escalate the problem internally to the help desk. Um, the escalation took two days to pick up, and uh, because it was not really a critical system, but uh, the app desk found accessing the system that uh, the, it obviously was the internal app desk. Uh, the the backend logs, uh, SQL logs, were disabled. That is not normal because the standard is to keep the 30 days of uh, uh, logs available for any database in this organization. And through the analysis, they discovered that a number of logins from a service account that it was not related to this system, but pertaining to a different web server in the same data center, were recorded into this. So the anomalies was escalated at this point to uh, the, the SOC people. And uh, with the initial uh, triage they ran, in the, the initial analysis they ran, they discovered that uh, there were a number of strange artifacts into the web server uh, from where the SQL database was accessed. So, the initial analysis confirmed, analysis confirmed the, the, the suspect compromise, and uh, they will start to collect some, some items from, from this situation. But in the end, uh, the people there was not able to correlate events and, and, and items they, had, they discovered, because they were evilly packed. So they decided to escalate the problem to, to, our, to our IR team. Uh, that is uh, already uh, was already having a contract with them for the escalation of the second and third tire. So we pick up the, the call and we pick up the analysis on October 23, um, and we definitely started with the, the items that they were show, uh, showing us and they have uh, they have collected before us. So we were having uh, a DMZ machine from where some of the uh, traffic was. Uh, generated strange traffic, the Sao Paulo workstation, and the, the, the SQL server. So the DMZ machine was the, uh, 
sensor of all the initial speculation because it was the web server and was having a number of different items, uh, interesting items. We started from this point and we asked the customer basically to give us visibility of systems in the uh, Brazilian data centers um, using our tool. I'm not just telling you guys, uh, I'm not ads, I'm, I'm not a sales guy. So this is not because uh, it's our say. It will be okay if there is any other type of tool. I mean, last week I went into Detroit to present a triage make by, uh, make through uh, Clem IV. So this is just to let you know about that. But uh, anyway, we were looking for system visibility. We were already having instead network visibility because the solution of RSA was already deployed into this environment. So we extended the full packet collection on other, on other areas of the network not normally touched by this. And uh, we deployed uh, OS forensic tool in about 20, 000, uh, 21,000 OS in a few days. Obviously, we collect artifact recovered, but initial attribution was not possible for a number of reasons I would discuss with you guys. So forensic analysis made by the other team show the presence of a number of strange PHP files dropped on August 27 on the web server. Collecting the logs of the web server, the team identified a, number of, a small number of uh, uh, machines uh, of the development and maintenance accessing the web server. Forensic analysis of this machine granted the identification of another uh, compromised workstation. And the creation and modification date of the suspicious file showed that this workstation was infected later than the web server. Analysis on the other DMZ servers on the same block confirmed the compromise, I mean, the lateral access of the SQL database. Uh, and the compromise was in September 13, 2017. So, these are a number of items that we collected immediately after we have been engaged by the customer. We were just looking to extend the analysis, collecting all the items that were around this segment of time already presented by the customer. And by thanks to that, we have been able to collect these items over there. The vast majority is a Mimikatz uh, variants, I mean, a number of Mimikatz files, but also a uh, network scanner developed in Go, that was really peculiar. I mean, there are a number today of uh, Go developed malware, but this one was not yet known by anybody. I mean, com compared to our knowledge base, uh, it was not firing any correlation. And uh, an NBT scanner that was in fact uh, a common open source uh, tool, but re uh, recompiled for a proper, a proper uh, capability to sneak through antivirus. And the last one was a Windows Credential Editor. Still an open source project, uh, very easy to, to, to collect from internet. Okay, we start to focus on the web server. And uh, between the PHP uh, content, we discover this uh, strike from the collection. Uh, there is nothing related to the, to the system. Uh, it was just a downloader. This one is a downloader. If you execute this page, you basically can tell through the page to the web server to go collect and download on it uh, a file, simply. And uh, it was used by the attacker to collect his arsenal and to move this arsenal of tools into the system. Luckily for us, we were able, through the network packet uh, decoder of uh, NetWitness, to collect the initial SQL injection of that day, the 27th of August, where the attacker start the infection. Basically, he uh, check for <coughs> uh, to, to upload uh, a file, a c.txt, in a in a uh, folder of the web server through a SQL injection that you can notice uh, highlighted by red, and uh, it was succeed. Uh, it was successful in in doing this. However, because the web server was indexing the content with uh, dynamic content in different pages, after that he started to look to the page that it has uploaded, the c.txt, and so he started to spend some time. It would take about five minutes, but still, he spent some time to go 
search for dc.txt, and once he found it, he knew that the SQL injection was okay, was working. So from that moment on, he started to upload his real stuff. C.txt was a simple decoy. It's a, it was written one, two, three, four. <laughs> That's simple, simple like that. And uh, the following one was a China Chopper. China Chopper is really known. Uh, everybody in the IR field probably, if, with a minimum experience of APT, uh, has already faced the China Chopper. So I don't want to spend much time on this. China Chopper is, however, very powerful. It's common. You can download it. You can collect it. You can even, <laughs> yes. <coughs> For, for the client side, for, for, the web, for, for the client side. You can just collect uh, the <laughs> script that is available in a number of different websites and just drop this in a file and execute it. So, and load it. So, from the perspective of China Chopper, there is not much to say apart that the following step in, in the infection was to drop the web shell and uh, to start running it in a system. Unfortunately, because this traffic was into the whole uh, container of the HTTP traffic uh, that was not targeted by our technology as potential malicious at the beginning. We were, uh, we were not able to continue collect the other items after the, the web shell dropped. So the other will be, will be waste because normally our technology have our retention about one or two weeks. So this was uh, uh, more than a month. However, between the file immediately dropped with the downloader I mentioned before into the web shell powered website, there was uh, this uh, ss.exe that is a backdoor. And uh, this file was, was, was found, found into the web server but was not active. There was no tracking data of this. But immediately moved into the workstation immediately. Well, takes some time, but he moved it to the workstation and in the workstation, he started to use it. Um, at the beginning, this file was packed, and uh, it was potentially not needed malware analysis. Normally, we tend to use malware analysis, especially for packet, heavily packed uh, executable, only once we have the time. At the beginning of the engagement, we were running out of time. I mean, we were considering all the chances of the compromise. We were more interested in identifying other occurrences. So the first thing we went to, uh, to do is, yes, analyzing it dynamically, but not spend much time into reverse for a moment, just because we need just to understand how it works. So it works in a way that is similar to NetCut, more or less. But it has some, it has some very interesting feature. Um, OK, if you run it through the H flag, it show you all the uh, potential options, OK? And uh, if you put it in listening with the L flag, it's basically a simple uh, server. I mean, it's a simple vector. But if you try to collect, connect to this vector and in send parameters, it doesn't work. It means that if you run this file as a simple vector, it doesn't work as you expect, like in Netcat or other type of vectors like that. So it requires additional elements. I don't want to waste time with this. We will discuss a little bit later. But instead, if you put it in a reverse, as a reverse shell, immediately it works. So once we discover that, and you can notice uh, between uh, in our lab, this is obviously in our lab. We Identify this, and we start to dig in into the occurrences of this into the packets. Okay, looking for other commonalities of, of this behavior in other systems. The first thing that jumped to our eyes immediately after unpacking the malware was that it was the coded in Go. Okay, Go is not a new for the malware. The first Real powerful Go-powered, Go-developed malware was uh, the Mirai botnet a few years ago. Uh, but however, it's uh, something a little bit new in the field of malware to have the development in Go running. But these days, I notice a number of these occurrences. From the perspective of the malware developer, there are some valid reasons to, to code in Go. First of all, it's difficult to decompile. It's difficult 
to, to reverse the beginning. Because there is no real debugger, and the compile needs to be uh, configured accordingly into IDA Pro or other types of compilers. But also the symbols, also the, the, the configuration of the, uh, of the strings and the common, and, uh, common elements are not really, really immediate to understand. At least for me, that was not really exposed to, to the Go. Second tool is the NBT scanner. This one is obvious. I mean, it's basically like uh, Nmap with the chance to, uh, it's very small compared to, Net, uh, to, to, to Nmap, sorry. Uh, but it got the chance to generate an output that is parsable with other scripts or with other tools. So this is the reason why they use this instead of SS.exe in general to scan, for example, NetBIOS uh, share. So this is a common and easy to collect file. So there is nothing in this that is really peculiar, but still useful to, to, to know. 64.exe and EIN.ps1 were two different flavors of, um, of Mimikatz. We know Mimikatz, we know the, how it works. I don't want to spend much time on this. The only thing that was obviously interesting is that the en.ps1 was stripped. It's a common power exploit tool for the, for, uh, the Mimikatz. But it was stripped of all the strings and common items that normally are used by the antivirus to identify the file. So good from them to, to, to think about it. And in fact, it was is nicked into systems easily, not noticed by the antivirus of the company. However, up to this point, nothing new. I mean, okay, scanners, mimic ads, but difficult to attribute this to anybody. Because every, not only APT group, but even the common cyber criminals know about these tools and know how to, to manage this. So we were looking to something you know, bigger, something more interesting, something more uh, capable of uh, attribution and classification to understand better where they were looking for. Uh, in our, uh, I, I speak as a team, in our previous experience uh, with APT Ward, we normally know more or less what is, what is the goal of the attacker based on the type of uh, uh, field the victim is, is working on, okay? But this is logistics, guys. It's not like aerospace, it's not like uh, defense, it's not like uh, uh, political institutions. It's uh, a logistic company that moves boxes from one place to another. <laughs> okay. <coughs> I went into another engagement a couple of years ago where Iranians breaches, uh, breached um, an environment. There was uh, an um, a night flight company, uh, a common night flight company, okay, uh, a travel company. They jumped there just to access uh, databases where the passports are recorded, because they were, were attempting to infiltrate people, showing record different than the one showed at the airport <laughs> to the guys <laughs> on the desk, okay. So it was it was difficult to attribute. I mean, it was difficult to think at the beginning because. It was complicated to understand the flow that goes into this system that was not into the company, but was just connected to the company, okay? But this one was extremely more complicated because there is no chance to start with something. Even when we ask manager, who can target you? Okay, C cyber criminals, yes, totally. Okay, because credit cards are in, in a number of these uh, databases, in a number of transactions, so yes. But the way they behave, the way they target this particular data center, this particular set of machine was not really Brazilian cyber criminal gang, okay? It was difficult to, to attribute to them. So we start to dig in a little bit into, into the, the, the question. And uh, by generating a number of IOC based on SS.exe and based on the other items, we basically discover a number of other occurrences, a number of other tools. Uh, these are explained like there. Uh, there. Okay. Some of them apparently are not really malicious. I mean, this sandboxy DLL was the problem. I mean, it's also often used as a first layer of protection sandboxy, especially for the browser. In a number of situations, I noticed this. So, 
Um, but in this case, there were no, there, there were no the entire sandbox application running on the system, just a number of DLLs, and an, uh, just one executable. So, and it was not the entire executable, not the entire deployment of sandboxy. However, there were others, like uh, debug srv.exe, that it was another uh, malicious tool, evilly packet, using uh, VM protect to, to, to encrypt, very complicated to reverse. And uh, there was this strange file that was uh, explore.dll. Okay, explore.dll, there is also a version that is uh, legitimate, okay? But this was not. Compared to the real one, totally different. So we start to think, okay, hmm, these tools are, these atoms are strange. But we go, fart. We move to this workstation where all the real problems uh, were generated because this was session was extremely active in the in the uh, last 30 days uh, since the beginning of the engagement. So the, since the beginning of, of the attack, sorry. So going there, we found a number of additional items, but in general, two were the folders where the infection was residing. One was in C pair log, not not new, and another in Windows debug. Um, Deeper analysis on the system uh, showed that immediately after attacking this, this box, the attacker removed every log. Okay? It's kind of like putting a sign <laughs> onto, the, <laughs> onto this. Um, basically, <clears throat> from this system, a number of lateral access were ex executed. Uh, this was against the file server that was shared between the workstation and the systems in the Brazilian, um, uh, uh, in the Brazilian environment. Uh, not the data center, but the internal uh, between workstation. Okay, we were considering the chance that the beginning of the infection of the workstation was done by uh, Windows exploit, Windows vulnerability, NetBias vulnerability, something like that. But, a number of problems were uh, negating this possibility, especially one, this, the, the DMZ and the internal system were segregated by tires of firewalls, and SMB was not available, so NetBIOS was not a chance for this, okay? So we start digging into, and thanks to the WMI uh, scripts and the, and the forensic tool, we were able to identify the execution of basically ss.exe, the tracking of ss.exe, that started from the drop of these two and all the arsenal in the DAT file from uh, a Java application. So definitely they have used um, a vulnerability of Java to achieve the control of this box. And in fact, they have used the, the actually known CV 2017-10 346. That is basically a vulnerability for the old version of Java, and this machine was running 1.6, so old, okay, where you basically force through a drive by download the infection of the machine. You just need to create a page, a rising Java exception into the machine, rising the Java virtual machine, the, the machine goes, and then you can be able to, you know, interact with the system. Um, all other items uh, discovered into the system, into the workstation, a number of other accesses, but two in particular were important. One, access to the ASDM, uh, ADSM console of the ASA firewalls into the, the, the environment, the ones of the local Brazil. And the one was the uh, system that was used as a jump box for, for contractors to work in the DMZ. Okay, so in both cases, interesting item to discover. And frankly, uh, we start to considering this APT because the way they behave, the way they uh, used to move was definitely not something uh, in the end of the common cyber criminal. We have experience of different cyber criminal, more advanced like Carbonac, stuff like that, and it was potentially comparable to that, but Carbonac normally use specific tools that we know. 
and nothing of that happens to, to, to uh, on our on our eyes, uh, rise on our eyes the attention. So once we notice the scan, once we notice the uh, remote access, we also notice that vast majority of the system accessed, laterally accessed, once interesting for a reason, were also infected. But all the system were having uh, updated antivirus, a number of other tools in place. So we were starting to question how that happens. I mean, without any sign on the antivirus console, without any sign of logs uh, on the CM, without any other additional potential anomaly recorded before that guy with the <laughs> access to the database. Okay, so start to think about about this. And uh, by the way, looking into the sandboxy stuff, we def we just noticed uh, another um, element that is the sandboxy rpcss.exe. That is basically one component of the execution uh, of Xmboxy. So, go back a little bit about Xmboxy. It's a program designed to protect system. It's a program designed to sandbox the execution of an application. And if you know how sandbox works, it basically it creates an environment that is almost segregated, almost, uh, uh, where the uh, single application is detonated. So in general, uh, my personal opinion in this, at the beginning at least, is if I am an attacker, I don't try to force the firewall. I don't try to force a security tool to achieve a control of a system. I can have a number of other options. But think, think about it. In this environment, the average protection was good from the endpoints perspective. Okay, So having this... Uh, other range good protection, the attacker wants to rely on something that he knows. And the problem is not known to the vast majority of people. So once even you have an anomaly, you before you think about that anomaly as correlated to an attack, you think twice. You probably look to other items more than that. Okay. So from a certain point of view, if you have the chance to exploit in a way or another the sandboxy, and uh, sandboxy is uh, considered legitimate in the environment. Why not? One item that immediately jump on our eyes doing malware analysis and comparison between the tools related to the sandboxy discovered in the system and the typical sandboxy environment, the typical sandboxy program, was the sbe.dll. Uh, that is one of the main components of Sandboxy. Comparing the DLL between the typical DLL for that particular version, okay? So the same exact version that the Meta were, were presenting, and the ones that we have, the, the, the malicious one was extremely more light. It was including a number of uh, typical um, APIs and instructions that are in the main API, in, in the main DLL, but it was having a couple of different components that were not into the typical sandboxy DLL. We start to think about that. And by the way, on the 6th of August of that year, 2017, on internet, uh, a CV related to sandboxy was published, related to a vulnerability into the sandboxy installer. So things were aligning a little bit. The attacker executed the attack on 27 of August, 20 days, almost 20 days later. Okay. So the typical sandboxy execution of the installer is expressed like that. I don't want to waste much time. It's for, it's for posterity. But basically, when you have downloaded the sandboxy and you want to install it, you simply click, files that are downloaded are, are dropped into the temp, from temp are moved into the program file folder. Then from that, a number of these items are executed in order to finalize the setup of the system and then start. The weakness relies on the execution at the beginning of the, the, the drop of the file into the temp folder. 
if, if during this particular step I subvert a number of DLLs, I can basically let the sandboxy execute different behavior than normal. The sandboxy will be installed apparently normal, but in fact, once I execute uh, launching the sandboxy executable, if I uh, linked into the sandboxy DLL, uh, the sbe.dll, additional, uh, I don't know, comments, additional code, that code will be executed. Just one step to, to highlight. In the boxes we have analyzed, Sandboxy was not installed at the beginning. So the original executable of Sandboxy was not present. So from a certain perspective, it's OK, the vulnerability. It's OK that we have the DLLs that are different and probably the ones that are abused to execute malicious file, but Sandboxy was not into the systems. So we were looking to the Sandbox executable into the system, and uh, the, 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 the typical executable, Sandboxy, was not available. So the next step of the attacker tactic was to create the condition exploiting this particular part, the, the, as I told you, the temp file, subverting that, strip Sandboxy temp file of all the items that are not needed, and create a small package that executed through console, load the sandboxy process that is signed, that is allowed into the environment, but immediately after, execute malicious code. That's the passage that the attackers uh, make into, into his. Uh, and, uh, Looking into the code of the sandboxy sdbi.dll, uh, we notice that explore.dll, that was malicious, that we have already identified, was rise as a, an, an hooked into the uh, sbhe.dll uh, um, dynamic library during the execution. Also, another, another, uh, Function was called, but in case where it's not available, not executed, that, ca that is called myload.dll. We investigated a little bit about myload.dll because we weren't having any chance to find. No, there was not available in any of the Invective system. And uh, by speaking with uh, a different company, we found that in environment, uh, they were having almost the same situation, but they have collected mylaw.dll, and mylaw.dll was a variant of TeslaCrypt used to wipe out all the items in the system. So if you drop mylaw.dll and you execute against Sandboxy, immediately that particular DLL will cancel securely, so we double passage all the files in the system that are pertaining to the infection. That's the goal. So they have the explore.dll, that is basically the, the first stage of the infection after the sandboxy. And uh, if you drop my load in the same folder, is the, the explorer executed, but again, my load is executed as well and basically wipe out the entire folder. So leaving no trace. Okay. Okay. I told you, uh, this is uh, how they make possible the host escape. Uh, obviously, we need to consider one aspect. The sandboxy process executed by this attack is not completed. So it's not really um, a complete sandbox available. So this is also the reason why they use this as a trampoline to infect. Because basically, they have uh, um, incapacitated sandboxy to really block occurrences like a normal security tool does. They just use it because creating the process of sandboxy that is signed, they can bypass a number of items. And because for the way sandboxy works, the resources in memory are declared on the environment and are static, they can achieve a control that is better than standard because the uh, address space layout randomization is not working the one that is provided by the uh, operating system. So they can basically leverage on this 
to have the chance to run their malware. Uh, in the end, if you drop this set of tools, this, this set of files, with explore.dll, and uh, you rename the function of the explore.dll that loads the second stage, you basically can execute a different malware, potentially. The malware that they have executed is debugsrv.exe. This is evilly packet, as I told you, I have anticipated. It's a backdoor, able to have keylogging, info stealing capability, a number of capabilities. But in the end, it's a Trojan. Um, unfortunately, we haven't found any correspondence between this malware and other items we have in our knowledge base. Um, this it probably don't mean anything, but we have a relatively huge database of uh, files and malware. Uh, so we normally, uh, one, once we proceed in creating IOCs or in creating components to investigate our database, if there are even just correspondences of segment of code, they normally jump up, even if false positive. But in this case, absolutely nothing, absolutely nothing. This is also the reason why not only having problem in classification, we will consider these a different APT, uh, a, a different APT group. And uh, we echo some of the uh, conclusion that Trend Micro and Kaspersky have uh, reached about a new uh, APT group that is basically not really interested in geopolitical stuff, but more into uh, cyber criminal sponsored activities um, that is called Chasing Other. And uh, there was having basically the, the the same type of uh, um, mechanism of subverting the system using different application, not this unboxing, but really similar to this. So we have, for this, just concluded that potentially we are facing the same, the same attacker. Absolutely not, not, not sure about this, and consider this obviously just a speculation, a pure speculation. But still, uh, chasing other in the, in the uh, reports of Casper Sky and uh, Trend Micro, show the similar capability. Mainly focus on Windows, mainly focus on, you know, leveraging on uh, Windows application vulnerability, DLL hijacking to overcome the standard protection of the systems in order to run their tool. Tools that are almost uh, evilly packed, evilly encrypted, they normally change easily and, and quickly their situs. They use algorithm, domain generation algorithm for, uh, you know, having the chance to skip the typical uh, network IOCs. Okay, this is for posterity, just a, num a small number of uh, Yara rules we have developed. I just want to spend one second with this. We normally don't create Yara in a way that is fire and forget. So we normally tend to create Yara that stays in our knowledge base in order for us to help in the attribution also. So these Yara are atomics, but we are developing a different ones based on a number of samples collected from different you know, companies with different malware researchers in order to realize a Yara that is not only able, able to catch malware where it is, but also to correlate by firing uh, dif different samples in, in different parts of the world. Don't move. OK. <laughs> um, this is the timeline of the incident. Uh, we have just put into this timeline the most important uh, elements we have, uh, we have uh, identified. Um, because there are a, a huge number of systems you, you can see in the following slide. We were having uh, about 273 systems. Uh, analyze and about them, two, 266 were touched or infected. But we have just briefly uh, identified uh, some items into this timeline that are uh, important to, to, to consider. So the first part, just make the same part that I have described. Another item that was interesting was that at one point, the attacker uh, identifying the ADSM, the, the console of, of Cisco ASA, identified the radio server behind the VPNs. So he immediately spent all his effort to reach this radio server that was an Active Directory uh, system. 
a Microsoft system. And so by leveraging on uh, the password they have uh, stolen earlier, they have been able to create custom users with a number of different uh, profiles in this AD. And from that point on, they stop using their backdoors. They just access through VPNs. And they have attempted to, to move laterally, not just in the Brazilian or the, in South America. They try to move into US and EMEA data centers, looking for real things, looking for data. And just in this moment, from that, that moment on, we understand a little bit better what they have in mind. Because they totally skip any interest in financial data. They were able to collect credit cards at one point. They don't care. They simply don't download this type of information. They started to focus on a number of uh, shipping contracts, specialized shipping contracts dedicated to Africa, where a number of these contracts were related to UN organizations. I don't want to go further in this because obviously means <laughs> Uh, discussing something that is uh, still under non-disclosure agreement, still under investigation, but just let you know that they were looking to understand how the UN is moving gear into uh, conflict area in Africa, especially in Central Africa, where on the other end, China is really interested in buying land. That's all. Um, this is still for posterity, it's a simple stat of the whole project. So we started on late uh, October. At the time, a number of systems were already compromised. Um, we have basically uh, concluded the investigation, the triage, in about 30 days. Um, at one point, going back to the timeline, uh, on the uh, US part, we have uh, identified the expil about this project I told you about. You, I told you about. So they, we have corrupted the, the uh, archives as normally is intended to do to avoid further, uh, further breaches. But on the other end, they insist and insist and insist. And we kept them working up to the moment when we were, we were able to scope the entire infection and remove them. Okay? They have attempted few weeks later to come back using almost the same tactic in a different data center, but it was already under, under our uh, eyes, so it was easy to, def uh, to uh, defuse. Okay, I have anticipated this. The remediation was basically uh, running host forensic analysis, uh, triage, and uh, distributing IOCs, atomic IOCs, on the entire envir environment. Um, looking for infections, looking for the presence of any malicious activity. Um, we haven't really uh, studied much the logs apart for the machines already touched it because we know they probably have uh, even uh, laterally moved to uh, other systems, but it was difficult for us uh, to, to scope the logs. Often these logs were just not enough to allowing us to dig into because the logs were rolled out. So we have mainly focused on items like uh, the files, like uh, the um, network behavior to, to realize the triage. One lesson that we learned from this, if it was needed, but it definitely was okay, is just not to think in a way that is a standard because the attacker normally think to how to uh, diffuse the standard way of thinking. So that's, that's, that's the thing. Thank you very much, guys, for, for that. If you have any question, I'm available. Time's okay? Yeah, of course. Okay. Do you have any question, guys? Please. Uh, okay, uh, good question, and uh, I would just say probably not. I mean, probably they are a very skilled set of individuals, okay? Probably coming from the cybercriminal world, but not the ones that is 
you know, in, uh, in Akin forums, standard Akin forums, stuff like that, but really, really good. And uh, the way they diffuse the protections and the capability that they've showed in terms of development definitely put them in a higher uh, set of, uh, of uh, and, and small set of uh, very dangerous group, but definitely it's sponsored in a way that they, at that time, were working for somebody. Okay. Mm, I don't know if they are cyber mercs or, or not. In other investigation that I anticipated by Trend Micro and, um, and the Casper Sky, they have stumbled in these guys uh, in two other uh, companies, private companies. And they were not looking into copyrighted material, but more into uh, how the money moves or, but, but not stealing credit cards, that's the point. More financial data, something that you can use to blackmail people, stuff like that. So they were, uh, if, con if confirmed they were the same, they were looking into items that normally are used by the politics still, okay? Uh, in this case, this is just the beginning because after that I was engaged by the UN organization and we discover part of these guys in the environment as well. So <laughs> this is something really, really big in, in a way that uh, is developing at the moment. Um, one question, one element that is interesting, however, is this one. One second. Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay. It's my right hand. <laughs> okay. So here, somewhere, oh, sorry. There are some uh, references to Chinese language from the browser. So that browser was Taiwanese or Chinese or Chinese language powered. So, you know, something that let us think. Uh, but in the Kaspersky case, the language was not Chinese. So we're still in doubt, not confirmed, okay? Other questions? Please. So what's the initial SQL injection? Was it related to any known CVP or known framework, or was it seemingly custom? No, it's not custom. It's, oh, my, oh well, the C.TXE was obviously created by <laughs> on the fly, OK? But this was a standard SQL injection against a, a Windows-powered um, Apache server. Very vulnerable, because it was a version, if I remember correctly. But it's uh, showed somewhere. Uh, it was 2.4 or something like that. So it was vulnerable, that's for sure. And in fact, this was one of the weakest link in the entire organization. Uh, unfortunately, we are not aware of this version. They haven't uh, analyzed this in the previous uh, penetration testing and vulnerability assessment that they have uh, run. So unfortunately, this is the occasion. Other questions? Please. For the infrastructure, did you guys track back? Like, what was their CNC? Okay, we haven't been able to show you CNC because it's still under investigation. Uh, two points, however. One of the C2 was in a very peculiar Chinese uh, uh, provider that is not really common. Uh, I mean, they, he, this provider owns just six or seven segments of uh, C, uh, C class. So very small, okay? And it's a virtual private host, okay? Um, the other one instead was in a French, French environment, a known huge uh, provider of uh, uh, VPS services. Uh, one of the first thing when we go into an environment and look for packets is to go for country, China, <laughs> and the other is this particular ISP in French, because it's very famous for holding a number of uh, situations in the past. Uh, they have an abuse that is definitely not working much. So if you send a request, they don't cooperate at all. And they know. <laughs> so uh, for the network communications with CNC, did you find that it was encrypted like static key or? or no, no. Okay. Yeah, the problem was that the bugs.srv because this is the only element that is actually really communicating. Uh, 
uh, it's funny because it basically has a cycle that runs and then can be modified on the fly with a command. So it runs for after 30 seconds, it starts beaconing, okay? For a minute or two. And if the answer, it collects answer from the other side, the other side will reply saying uh, six minutes. Then the following will be after six minutes, 12 minutes or whatever. So from that perspective, it's very peculiar. Unfortunately, I haven't been able to show you guys this because still, I, uh, as I told you, it's still under investigation. The communication were in SSL, unfortunately. So uh, it was a little co bit complicated to, to, uh, to solve, and uh, we are still working on that. But definitely, there are some commonalities in the beaconing way. So there are a number of uh, content we have developed for our technology that is able to pick up the presence of the beacon. Uh, following the beacon, when the commands are sent, still investigating on this. Not really easy to achieve the control upon this uh, set of communication stuff. Please. It sounds like if they implemented whitelisting, that would have pretty much shut this attack down, wouldn't it? Uh, well, uh, re related to the sandboxy stuff, they use sandboxy so they can't blacklist sandboxy in their environment. And unfortunately, if you sandbox, if you black box, uh, sorry, if you uh, blacklist the application running in sandboxy, you don't achieve a real block because basically sandboxy present uh, the process sandboxy for executing the malware. The malware. So from that perspective, is not really a way to block the infection. So whitelisting, we normally don't consider that really a solution. Uh, for a number of reasons that you can understand, okay? Any other question? Thank you very much, guys.